Welcome, dear friends of human spaceflight. A lot is happening with regards to the final frontier. For one, let's talk about how SpaceX wants to make Starship the first carbon neutral rocket in the history of mankind, as if to completely destroy the arguments of so called environmentalists that accuse Elon Musk of being a hypocrite because he is supposedly destroying the environment with his rockets. Then the Space Force celebrates its second anniversary and it has, as you might have guessed, big plans for the future. Then a new development in the China vs USA moon race, we now have confirmation that China's new heavy lift rocket that will land their Taikonauts on the moon now has a time frame for its maiden launch. Then let's also briefly talk about the James Webb Space Telescope. How much better than Hubble will it actually be? There's a lot to talk about, so stay tuned. An argument that the anti-Elon Musk, neo-Luddite, hate bandwagon, uninformed masses and media alike tend to repeat like a fanatic prayer is that Elon Musk is a giant hypocrite because on the one hand he wants to accelerate the transition to sustainable and renewable energy and transportation with his company Tesla, but on the other hand his space company SpaceX is polluting the environment and emitting huge amounts of greenhouse gases. This is an argument which is roughly on the same level of intelligence, namely close to zero, as the one that human spaceflight is a waste of money and that we should concentrate on first solving our problems here on Earth before we go to space, an argument that has probably been debunked already hundreds of times. But the argument that SpaceX is bad for the environment makes kind of sense at first, at least on the surface. Isn't SpaceX launching lots of rockets to space? And aren't rockets emitting greenhouse gases? Especially SpaceX's Starship and Super Heavy rocket system, isn't that behemoth of rockets not running on liquid methane and oxygen? And isn't methane a very potent greenhouse gas, hence every launch of Starship is bad for the environment and thus in turn SpaceX is a company that increases global greenhouse gas emissions and contributes to global warming? Isn't Elon Musk thus a giant hypocrite? Well, we already have actually known since quite a while that Elon's goal is to generate fuel for Starship from CO2 out of the air. Basically, if you combine CO2 with hydrogen, H2, under high pressure at 400 degrees Celsius, you obtain methane, CH4, and water, H2O. So you obtain Starship fuel by sucking CO2 out of the air. To this end, Elon has recently reiterated this goal in a tweet on December 13th, saying, quote, SpaceX is starting a program to take CO2 out of atmosphere and turn it into rocket fuel. Please join if interested, end quote. Not long ago, Elon Musk had donated $100 million to an X-Prize competition that searched for the best proposals of how to capture the most CO2 out of the air with proposals that were being submitted from all around the world. For example, one team with members from Monash University in Melbourne and from Malaysia received $250,000 from that X-Prize money. Emily Tiao, the CEO of this new carbon capture project called MC3, shared some details on how this process will work. Quote, we submitted a biotechnology proposal that consisted of biologically assisted carbon capture and conversion methods which focused on the capture of CO2 from the ocean and air via artificial forestry and microalgae cultures in novel design floating photobioreactors. The biomass produced from these carbon farms will then be utilized downstream, powered by bioenergy, in their transformation into cross-laminated timber for sustainable buildings and biochar, a charcoal that can be used for soil amendment." End quote. Okay, so basically it's a twofold approach where one path is the obvious one, namely to plant more trees, because as we know trees suck out carbon from the air. The other one are floating bioreactors where high carbon containing biomass will be stored. In a secondary process, the carbon can then be extracted from this biomass for further applications, one of which could be to generate Starship fuel. Of course, what will be important will be scalability. Can this be done on a very large scale? 
This is what Elon's X Prize is trying to solve. And there will be many more interesting proposals coming soon that will get a share of those hundred million dollars of prize money. So Elon wants to solve two giant problems of our time in one go. How to revert climate change and reduce the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere in order to limit global warming and maybe even reverse it. And how to, by doing so, kill two flies with one stone by solving the other big problem of humanity, namely transforming us from a primitive species bound to their home planet like the losers of the galaxy and turn that species into a truly space-faring civilization with cities on the moon, Mars and later even on other bodies in the solar system. This is the brilliance and long-term vision of Elon Musk where he tries to solve multiple big problems of humanity at the same time. So next time a neo-Luddite repeats the phrase he read on his favorite trash news media outlet that SpaceX is so bad for the environment, you know exactly how to respond. And please subscribe to this channel if you are interested in news on spaceflight with a sarcastic undertone. Thanks a lot in advance. From SpaceX to Washington DC. The newest branch of the US military was celebrating its second anniversary on December 17th, 2021. Even with a delta symbol shaped cake. Nice. The Space Force has gotten some ridicule since its foundation, which is pretty normal, considering that humans like to make fun of everything that is new and unusual, even if it turns out to be awesome. The Netflix comedy show Space Force certainly didn't help with the public perception of what this new military branch is about. Lieutenant General Nina Armagno, director of the Space Force staff, said during a Space Business Roundtable event on December 15th that this view is slowly starting to change. This is for example due to news reports about China's technological advances in space and hypersonic missiles and Russia's recent anti-satellite missile test. This provided clear illustrations of the role that space plays in national security. Quote, there's a lot of strategic competition in space and I think Americans are seeing it, end quote, the lieutenant general said. The Space Force is still the smallest branch of the US military, understandably so, with 6,500 uniformed members known as Guardians, but it's growing steadily. The Space Force is a very fervent proponent of Starship with studies being conducted on how SpaceX's giant reusable rocket could be used to transport personnel and or cargo to anywhere on the planet quickly. And if the Space Force is backing SpaceX, we know that this is a good sign for the future of both Starship and of Space Force. The main adversary of the Space Force, it's no secret, is China. In the video before the previous one, we were talking about the new China vs US space race to the moon. Some high-ranking officials of the Chinese space industry had revealed that the new Reds want to send manned missions to the moon maybe even before 2030. And quite recently, Long Le Hao, a name which I'm certainly pronouncing absolutely wrong, a senior space industry figure and Long March launch vehicle designer told the Chinese state media CCTV on December 10th that the new Chinese moon rocket will already have its maiden flight as soon as 2026. This is surprisingly early and a really aggressive time frame, considering that previously China had a quite relaxed pace with its moon landing ambitions. Previously their plans foresaw Taikonauts landing no earlier than 2030, more likely around 2035. We talked extensively about this new rocket system, its capabilities and how China wants to land on the moon in this video here. So while China seems to be speeding up their efforts, the US is slowing down. Under the previous administration, they had a really aggressive goal of landing astronauts in 2024, something which would have been really inspiring. But unsurprisingly, this new kind of sleepy US administration was not too keen on keeping that aggressive timeline, because that would have actually involved some real effort. And we know that Boeing, Lockheed and Northrop don't really like aggressive timelines. 
Therefore, as the US landing date slips to 2025 earliest, quite possibly to 2026, it seems that China wants to pull their landing date forward, so that indeed this decade could turn out to be very exciting regarding this new moon race. Either way, no matter which nation will be there first, we luckily know that SpaceX will build a private moon base either way. So that in the end, all of humanity will win. Now a bit on the James Webb Space Telescope that already has all the scientists excited and afraid at the same time. Afraid because should something go wrong with the launch of the European Ariane 5 rocket, it would be a huge disaster for humanity. Thus, everything must go perfectly during launch and hence the pressure onto every person involved in the launch preparations is crazy high. But why is the James Webb Telescope so awesome in the first place? And how much better is it than the Hubble Space Telescope? Well, first of all, the JWST has a mirror that has a diameter of 6.5 meters compared to Hubble's 2.4 meter mirror. Thus, as the light capture capacity is proportional to the mirror surface area, which in turn is proportional to the radius squared, the James W Space Telescope will have 7.34 times the light capture capacity compared to Hubble. And it will have 2.7 times the resolution of Hubble. So we are talking about an instrument here that is much more powerful than the Hubble Space Telescope. And we all remember how powerful Hubble is and what kind of extremely high resolution images Hubble has already given us. A major difference to Hubble is though, that the JWST is an infrared telescope, thus it observes at longer wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum compared to Hubble. From the red end of the visible light spectrum at 600 nanometers to the far infrared at 28 micrometers of wavelength. This means that the JWST will be able to observe details that Hubble could not observe because infrared, for example, passes through large interstellar gas clouds. This will also allow for infrared spectroscopy of exoplanet atmospheres, which will be extremely exciting for exoplanet research and for the new branch of exobiology. Thus, this really will open up a new era in astronomy and hence everybody is completely on edge before the launch. Let's hope that everything will go well. So thanks a lot for watching this episode, dear viewers. We wish you all the best from our team and on to the future.